Thank you for watching this recording of the Women's Caucus Critical Issues in Women's Health webinar titled In Conversation with Writing Black Girls and Women's Health Science that was held on March 22, 2024. The APHA Women's Caucus is committed to providing a forum for the uninhibited discussion of emerging, not often considered important issues affecting the lives and health of women. You can find more information about the book, Writing Black Girls and Women's Health Science, by clicking on the link in the description box. You can follow the Women's Caucus on our website and social media platforms to stay abreast of our current activities. The speakers in this webinar include Dr. Jamila Nicole Barlow, Carlisha Isaacs, Tony Junius, Danielle White, Dr. Miranda Ward, Dr. LaConte Dill, and Dr. Tambra Stevenson. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for the invitation um, to myself and the wonderful collaborators that I had on this project. Um, first, I just, I'm actually in Chicago, and I just want to acknowledge the land that I'm on in Chicago land, the three fires, the Confederacy, the Potawatomi, the Ottawa and uh, the Ojibwe nations. I always like to honor the land, the people who work the land and the resources and knowledges that came from the land. So just honored to be here to talk about this book. Um, and I sent a coupon code to Dr. Williams. So please share that with all the attendees. If you don't have the book, please don't pay full price. We can talk about um, the capitalism and academic book sales. Um, but I'm excited to be here because this idea and project actually um, originally was birthed in an election year. It was 2016. Myself and Dr. Dill, Dr. Dill, like I like to call her, um, we were on our way to NWSA, National Women's Studies Association, for a meeting. And we were very much, um, you know, it was a time right after the 2016 elections, they were checking our return flights to Canada. That's where the meeting was. And they really wanted to make sure that all these women were coming to, um, to Canada after this election. And when we were there, she and, a, and another um, friend, we were all talking about just like how disenchanted we were with kind of the state of how we're addressing Black girls and women's health. And one of the panels that I went to um, was a panel filled with editors from journals. And one of them was the great Paula Giddings. Um, if you don't know Paula Giddings, please do look her up. And, um, and her contribution to the literature on Black women's history is just enormous. And so I remember standing up and saying, look, this is our struggle. This is our frustration. And... Um, and Paula Giddings, Dr. Giddings was just like, you know what, you should do a special issue in my journal. And we actually ended up being the last um, special issue that she approved prior to her retirement. So that can be our claim to fame. From there birthed so many projects. So we did the special issue in Meridians. Um, it's a women's studies journal. You can check it out. And I co-edited it with Dr. Dill, and you'll hear from her shortly. And then what happened is... Um, from there, I was at Towson University at the time. We had the first conference, to my knowledge, of that level. We had over 200 participants there to talk about Black girls and women's health. And it was beautiful at Towson University. And then from there, I developed a course at George Washington University um, with the name, that same name as the book, Writing Black Girls and Women's Health. And I've taught that twice. And then I had, um, I was in an APA conference, American Psychological Association. And they asked me, this. The, the publisher of the book asked me to write a book on my research. And at the time, it was 2020, 2021, I forget which year. And I had had experienced a lot of grief due to COVID, family members um, who had COVID. And I decided I could not write a book, but I drew upon my village. And so I reached out to all of the folks in the book and they said, yes, and this is what we created. And so you're going to hear a little bit about what everybody did. Um, I want to frame it. Um, first, and then I'm going to introduce everyone. So, cause it's a lot of us on the call and I want to be mindful for all of our time, but I'm thank you. I'm thankful for all of you who are in the room. Some of these names look familiar. You could have been everywhere, but you decided to be with us on this Friday. So we're grateful. I want to just, um, 
I have an opening quote that I want to frame it to just give you a little bit more about me. And then I just want to punt it to the others and then we'll just have a conversation. So the quote that I like to start with is on page three and four of the book. If you don't have the book, I think you just put the file, the coupon code in the chat. But one of my favorite quotes of mine is what we're trying to do in this book. And a lot of people are like, what do you mean writing Black girls in women's health science? Um, I explain it in the introduction, but in short, I teach writing about women's health at GW. And people think writing is just writing. But writing about health also requires you to think about um, your ontologies and your epistemologies. And those are your philosophies of science, those steps that come before what methodology you choose to do. But when you look at a lot of our history, we haven't engaged enough with that. And if we did, we'd understand a lot of our science and health is rooted in eugenics and scientific racism. So how can we reframe that? And so I asked these beautiful, beautiful scholars to say, what are your philosophies of science? And that's what they did. And so what we're doing is, and I quote on page three and four, we subvert notions of whiteness, patriarchy, and capitalism as the gold standard for health behaviors, frameworks, theories, and methodologies. When we have epistemologists such as granny midwives, birth workers, community healers, church women, hairstylists, conjurers, herbalists, and naturopaths, with ways of knowing that have carried us over generations. Why don't we engage in those ontologies and epistemologies? They've sustained us and they will continue to sustain us and allow us to thrive. And so I have much more to say, but you wanna hear from everyone. So I wanna introduce um, the next chapter author and she's literally the next chapter. Oh, after the foreword from, um, in the book from um, Linda Goler Blount, who's the, the president and CEO of Black Women's Health Imperative, where I'm a scholar in residence, you have a chapter from Lacante Dill, Dr. Lacante Dill, and I will let her introduce her chapter and share with her. And then we will hear from um, Dr. Ward, then from Tambra Stevens, no, from um, the Wish Lab, which includes Tony Junius, um, Danielle White, Carlisha Isaacs, and then we'll hear from Tambra Stevens and we'll have a larger conversation. Thank you, Dr. Barlow. Thank you, Jamita. Um, I want to also start with a land acknowledgement, um, actually what I call a land, labor, and life acknowledgement. So I am zooming in from East Lansing, Michigan, which similar to where Jamita is zooming in from um, is the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. I also want to pay homage to Black folks who have um, were stolen without their consent, but um, have been still and paid for the labor which also built this country, which is now known as the America. And then I wanna call in all of us to commit to the struggle for liberation and justice. I am Dr. Lacante Dill. I am um, the Director of Graduate Studies as of January, and for the last three years, an Associate Professor in the Department of African American African Studies at Michigan State University. Um, I'm also a playwright and a poet and a mommy and a friend and a sister. Um, and speaking of sisterhood, in addition to the pivotal year of, of 2016 that birthed a lot of this work and while we're here today, I also want to credit the late 90s um, to date us, um, where Jame Dr. Barlow and Dr. Ward and I were um, at Spelman together. Um, and I know that that time as young girls becoming women, as we were studying liberal arts, as we were studying and practicing Black feminisms, as we were also being interdisciplinary and also studying and committing to the, the practice of public health, um, that also birthed this work, this dream. Um, and part of that is this collecting, this gathering of folks, of scholars, of artists, of thinkers and doers that we continue to do um, throughout our lives. Um, including folks that we teach, but definitely folks that we learn from and work with. Um, so with that, as Jamita said, um, I'm chapter three, which is titled Black Girl Wellness. And I'm just gonna share two sections with you. Um, the first is a invitation to know and remember. So I want you or us all to know and remember black girls beyond trauma, beyond statistics 
beyond erasure, beyond hashtags for lives that are snuffed out. I want us to know and remember Black girls as nuanced, as joyful, as protected, as ordinary and extraordinary, as healing and as worthy. Shout out to Worthy Wonder, who is my daughter, but also reminds us that we are worthy. And then um, just given the time, I want to um, end the conversation for now, my part with um, an invitation to practice very briefly with me. So everyone on the call, um, if you just wanna do a quick meditation, um, a contemplation, this appears on the book, um, starts on page 33. So get comfortable in your seat. I invite you to close your eyes. We're only gonna be here for a beat. Take a deep breath, expand your body, expand your notions of yourselves and the folks that we work with. Take a deep, longer breath out. Continue this practice of breathing deeply in and out. And I invite you to remember your 14 year old self. What do you see? What did you call yourself then? Call out to them. What were you proud of back then? What were you worried about? What do you know now that you wish you knew back then? Tell them that. Give them some tips for their journey. Remind them that they are enough. You can come back to this collective Zoom space. Thank yourself for that brief practice. And I want to thank everyone for that collective practice. Thank y'all. Thank you, Dr. Dill. And we're going to engage in more conversation. Next up, you have Dr. Ward. Thank you so much for coordinating all of this and for curating this masterpiece, Dr. Barlow. Um, I appreciate the the exercise, you know, Doc Deal. So thank you for, you know, allowing for us to engage in that meditative practice. My name is Dr. Miranda Ward, and um, I go by she, her pronouns. I'm a cisgender Black woman, but I will forever be a Black girl. And I just wanted to, you know, highlight that this book is actually called Writing Black Girls. I don't know if you noticed, the, the term Black girls is combined as an identity. And I really think that it's really important for us to think about how Black girls, um, not just the developmental perspective of like, oh, first you're a girl, now you're an adult. No, just thinking of Black girls as an ethos. And so that's one of the things that I, hopefully we'll be able to kind of talk about in our Q&A discussion. But I'm a forever Black girl. I'm also a forever a Cali girl, like Dr. Hill. <laughs> and so, you know, mama from Arkansas, daddy from, New, you know, New Orleans, migrated out West. And even though, yes, that's where I was born and raised, I have planted roots in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., which is where I'm calling in from, which is the uh, ancestral lands of the Nacostic tribe, who were, um, historians refer to as the Anacostans. And I, you know, describe myself as a community engaged scholar. All of the courses that I teach in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences at GW are community engaged. And so my classrooms are never limited to the four walls of, you know, any academic building. DC remains my classroom. And so when I was thinking, I know during the height of the pandemic, when, um, you know, the then Surgeon General Jerome Adams basically got up in front of the nation and um, was talking, there was like a coronavirus, like White House briefing. And he was talking about how black and brown people need to do better and, you know, get off drugs. And basically, if you don't do it for yourself, do it for your big mama. That really struck me for a variety of reasons, I'm sure. <laughs> but in thinking about who big mamas are, right? And literally the title of my chapter is, you know, Black women stay fighting structural racism. And I, I call out other mothering as community practice, right? So again, Black women have been doing this work. And, you know, and that's one of the kind of the lens that we bring to this book and not just focusing on you know, disparities and lack and, you know, and risk of Black women, but the ingenuity and the strength and the, the healing. And so I want to just call out that I recognize the historical, social, and cultural connotations attached to describing Black women as caregivers. This description does not always reflect autonomy and rights. For instance, there's a sordid history of Black women being coerced into caregiving roles that required them to breastfeed white women's babies through chattel slavery that has morphed into a unidimensional mammy trope. 
But when I write about mamas, I'm pulling on the idea that Black women are the center of Black families and communities. And we often serve in a caregiving or other mothering capacity, whether or not we birth children of our own. And so I, you know, basically I name several big mamas, including Dr. Barlow and Dr. Dill in this chapter. But I really um, kind of pay homage to Dr. Yoya Adele Creer Perry. She's the founder and president of the National Birth Equity Collaborative, as well as Dr. Venus um, Evans Winters, who's a, the founder and a writer of Planet Venus, and finally, Trisha Hersey, who's the founder of the Nat Ministry. And I really lean into their work for standing in the gap, right? When educational systems, healthcare systems fail Black women, these are Black women, you know, of the mothers, big mamas, basically, um, you know, symbolically, culturally, theoretically, and all of the above that have been doing the work. So I look forward to kind of continuing the conversation for us recognizing the big mamas, the other mothers in our lives. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. And I can't wait to get into some of those conversations, especially why Black Girl. I'm going to punt that to Dr. Dill when it comes time, because she wrote about that in her chapter and that lineage and where that comes from. Next up, I want to hear from the Wish Lab. Um, and I'll we'll start with Tony and then have Danielle and Carly should chime in, but I know that Tony and Bria um, really corralled this group together. And before, let me introduce who the WISH Lab is. It's the Women Intersectionality Science and Health Lab. This is my research and writing lab, um, which, you know, went a little, you know, this has been a crazy year, but you're going to get an email from me, lab. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk more, but I want you all to talk about your experience and, and your chapter, and then we'll, we'll go to Tamper Stevenson. Yes, thank you, Dr. J. Uh, yes, being a part of the WISH Lab has just been such an amazing experience. I was a part of the lab as a graduate student at GW. And um, so a little bit about me, Tony Genius. Yeah, so I am based in Washington, D.C., but I'm bi-coastal, so I'm tuning in from the San Diego area, so a Cali girl also. Um, and I'm a healing artist, holistic wellness practitioner, and women's health researcher. Um, so I have many hats, um, like many of us, but really excited to come today as my writing hat. Um, so the Wish Lab was just a great way for me to share my student experience experience, especially at a predominantly white institution of like how we can center the lived experiences of Black girls and Black women. When we talk about health, like in the public health space, a lot of times it's the deficit approach. Um, it doesn't always talk about our holistic practices, like Dr. J grounded us in the beginning of our lineages, of our ancestors' practices. And so to have the course and the lab to really dive deeper into that has been such a beautiful experience to write alongside um, my colleagues and the process to, to edit with Bria um, and to have these conversations with the students, uh, which is so meaningful. And then when Dr. J was like, do you want to be a part of the book? I was like, oh, this is so special and sweet to have our writings and our musings like physically live somewhere. Um, so something I just wanted to share and then I'll pass the mic to the rest of the group. Um, so when we talk about Black girls and women's health, um, something that I wrote in the chapter was radical joy and intentional rest is how Black girls and women find meaning and cope with life's stressors to feel whole again. We can reimagine Black girls and women's health by integrating Black feminist and womenist approaches to health that center the everyday experiences of Black women and girls discovering self-love, self-care, sisterhood, well-being on our own terms. And recognizing ourselves as our number one priority is how strength can transform into intergenerational healing. So that's kind of what grounded me in the writing of this chapter um, and just kind of the lens I come from. So I'll pass it um, to Carlisha. Hi, yes, thank you and happy Friday to everyone. Um, very excited, very happy to be here. Um, similar, just to reiterate, Tony's sentiments and everything. Um, this truly was just a very honoring um, opportunity that Dr. J invited us for and everything. Um, I joined the Wish Lab um, as a postgraduate. Um, and so as Dr. J always says, you know, once a member of the Wish Lab, always a member of the Wish Lab. Um, it really is just a community of individuals coming together from different backgrounds of both um, academically, professionally, um, different interests that all happen to have alignment. 
um, and overlap with one another. Um, and so again, it this was just just the biggest honor. Um, and one of the things that we really um, emphasized on in terms of the themes um, within our chapter um, was Black joy. And there's also um, a part of it where I think Tony really eloquently describes um, in terms of redefining strength, um, specifically with Black women and girls and everything. And just to reiterate that, I there's a quote um, specifically with Audre Lorde um, in terms of self-care um, and just self-care as a radical act, um, where she says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. And I believe that because of the health disparities within our society um, and experiencing things like joy and rest and laughter and having those moments of happiness within your community makes it all the more important and all the more political. Um, and I will stop there and pass it on to Danielle. Thank you, Carlisha, and thank you, Tony. I'm Danielle White. I'm a junior undergraduate student at George Washington University. I became involved in the WISH Lab my very first year, first semester, when I took Professor Barlow's incredible course on Black girls and women's health. And that was the beginning of beginning to think critically about my identity within the context of health and joy and sickness and forward movement and backwards movement all together. And so when I think about my contributions to the 13th chapter, I'm thinking about what it means to leave behind that legacy of assuming that Black women are meant to simply be exhausted 24-8. This legacy that assumes that Black women are meant to feel sick and tired consistently. I integrate the Fannie Lou Harmer quote that says, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that is exactly where my writing takes me. I want a world where Black women, when they are sick, they're taken care of. When they are tired, they're taken care of. And when they're joyful and light and vibrant and feeling good, they're also taken care of and held. Before logging on, I was thinking about how I was coming into the space as a Black woman, as a Black girl, and I couldn't help but think about Sanaya Spain, a 19-year-old Black woman who had her life taken because she rejected a man's advances. She was with her twin, going to the bodega late at night, just want to get a little something, and her life was taken from her. And when I write, I think about the stories like hers of the devaluing of Black female existence to the point where so recklessly our lives can be taken. And when I think of that, that even further propels why I write. I want to write to create structures in which Black women, Black girls are so worthy, so cared for that violence is not even a thought nor a threat. And I think that's what I write for. I write for all of the girls who just want to have fun with their homegirls and go to the bodega and get their favorite snack. That's what I write for. I'm writing for the Black mothers, the Black girls, Black femmes, anyone who has felt that Black femme experience. I'm writing for all of those populations. And to wrap up before I pass it back, I'm always thinking of this painting by Annie Lee, and it's this Black woman. She's in her nightgown, her white nightgown, and she's sitting at the edge of the bed, and she just looks tired. But as I re-looked at the image before I logged on today, I couldn't think about the fact that she's sitting at the edge of the bed because she's still getting up. She's absolutely exhausted. You can see it in her body language, but she's still getting up. And I think that is the Black girl magic. The idea of even though we can be so exhausted, we're tired, we're just in our nightgowns, we want to go back to bed, we want that rest, but we're still getting up. And so to write for that balance of that Black girl magic that picks us up when we're down is why I write. So I'll pass it over to Tamara. <clears throat> Thank you all for just setting the tone of creating a space for Black women's voices to be heard at a time when I 
can reflect on growing up in Oklahoma. Uh, though we have a strong Black history, it's been even marginalized within the canon of Black America. And so to be able to now call D.C. home, which has been a center of so much uh, revolutionary work when it comes to making a claim and name um, and uplifting the ancestors of those who we stand on their shoulders to help usher in a new way and vision of how we see our health um, is a powerful claim that we're making today, even as we gather. When I think about chapter 14 that I contribute to the after, uh, after Ford um, in collaboration with a number of scholars, one who I've called a mentor, Dr. Shariki Kumika, which I was an intern when she was at UPenn before Drexel, uh, Melissa Witt was on that same research team. So we go way back. Um, but in 2019, when we convened to create the Council on Black Health, um, just as someone who was just a PhD student still at American University School of Communication, uh, thinking through my calm lens of what if we had a declaration of some kind that really created a framework and how we think about Black health as this new organization comes into fruition. I thought about the Black Panther Party and what they did with the 10 point program. I thought about the UN Declaration of Human Rights and this right to food, right to health, all the things that we still have not signed on as a country. And I thought that what would a framework do for scholars, do for advocates, do for just Black people and making a declaration as the founding fathers of this country did and sharing their grievances to the British Empire. And so for that, I just wanted to just inform the importance of why these sorts of frameworks matter um, and how we can think about how to use this in our everyday work, in our scholarship, um, because frameworks matter, as we know, as scholars, it helps to make meaning of the mess and help to organize and really not just agonize, but help mobilize movements around these issues like Black women's health. And so one, frameworks help with legal recognition of understanding that a Bill of Rights can provide some kind of legal weight and signaling that we're not merely just making suggestions or aspirations, but it's fundamental into the entitlement of how we should see ourselves being protected and upheld with these rights. It, it empowers us as a people, and, and one of the rights speaks to that power and autonomy and the agency that we continuously have to fight for in this climate of anti-DEI work that we cannot be rested, um, but we have to understand this isn't an everyday fight. We've seen it in the Reconstruction era and history only repeats itself as we understand Sankofa from the Akan tradition. Also, it provides the visibility that we know that these sorts of documents can provide to help articulate and sharing talking points and speaking to media, to policymakers, and to anyone who doesn't understand why Black health matters and how that Black health matters began really declining post-emancipation when we were no longer property of slave owners who saw the benefit of keeping their property healthy, but now saw the need to no longer provide those same health benefits to us as humans and individuals. And the historical context that we paint here is also the clear reason why, because at a time when in the early 1900s, late 1800s, when you look at black women who down into sea beyond before there was ever a syphilis study. And part of what my research at AU speaks to is understanding black women's health activism at the local level was the foundational work to what Booker T. Washington and others were ever doing. And their names have to be uplifted um, because they have been these hidden figures in our healthcare system. And so when we think about going through these articles, I really want folks to say this, this was foundational work. How can you move this forward? How do you operationalize this? How can you begin using this as frameworks that can be used within health equity legislation, similar to ALEC and what they've done around prison, uh, you know, uh, prison issues that have not gone in our best interest as a community, but understanding that when we have these templates in place, that it actually helps to make it easy for people to feel that they have a sense of agency to move issues forward, such as that our Black health matters. Thank you. Thank you, Tambra. I appreciate how all of you have kind of framed 
I think kind of how I want the conversation to go now, what I'm going to do now is really offer up um, some questions for what I've heard and how you all have framed your chapters. Um, I want to start with Lacante and just in the interest of time, if we can keep it brief, but I know, I know. Um, I want to start with Lacante because part of um, what we do in this, I'm very clear, I, I lost my quote, um, I'm very clear in this book about how, here it is, I want to read it because it's just easier when you read it with your words instead of trying to recall. On page seven, I said, this was right after the Toni Morrison's racism quote, I said, we are not in deficit of literature describing the status and explaining the health outcomes disproportionately affecting Black girls and women's health. This descriptive and explanatory work is important, foundational, and necessary to the canon of Black girls and women's health. Yet this book is not that work. We are not distracted. And so I want you to kind of frame for us why Black girl is so important and why a strength-based approach to this work is necessary. And that was intentional. This is not a book where we say Black women have the highest rate of this or the highest rate of that. We don't do that. Why would that be important, Dr. Dill? So I want to, as you always talk about, Dr. Barlow, um, my my citational praxis. So I want to um, pay honor to Dr. Joyce Ladner, uh, Dr. Nikki Jones, and Dr. Ruth Nicole Brown, who are just some of the um, titans of what now is called Black Girlhood Studies. Um, and so for almost the last 60 years, um, they are some of the important knowers, doers, and thinkers that are calling us in to remember Black girls, right? From spending time with Black girls, for letting Black girls speak for themselves. So always cite, read Black women. Um, and in their work, they are reminding those of us who are Black women to do what I asked for in the meditation, like remember our own Black girl selves and not erase that or just move on, um, particularly as we go into our professions, our data collection, our analysis. But also in the public health field, um, we know that public health at times can even forget ourselves and the work that we've done as a field, um, that like amnesia. Um, and so public health um, often just collapses Black women's health. Um, and I'm not asking for like a disaggregation of the data. I talk about this on page 36, but a, a literal intention of thinking and knowing and unpacking the lives of Black girls. And I've learned so much from letting Black girls do that data collection. Letting Black girls, that's their data, to own that data, to speak about that data, to unpack that data, to call that data out. Um, and I know also that about 10 years ago, um, funders were telling me like, oh, don't focus on the Black girls. Like, what about the boys and men? Because of that time, 2011, 12, 13, when boys and men of color, it was fundable, right? So everybody was doing boys and men of color work and folks were telling me not to do focus on black girls. But if I really think about liberation, I'm thinking about one, all people, but definitely black girls and black women. And so um, it's just interesting how the amnesia, the, the erasure, um, but we have always been nuanced. So this is a call to be nuanced, to be complicated, to be a little bit uncomfortable and to continue to push ourselves. Thank you, Doc Dill. I appreciate that. And I think a larger part of this work as well is understanding how we're offering another way of doing this work. And that requires us to center Black women. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Ward, in your chapter, you talk about other mothers, you talk about big mama, and you really bring in people who may be widely known, like a Trisha Hersey, that are non-academic. How is this chapter useful for non-academics? Um, how is what what message can they get out of this, not just researchers or those who do policy? So, you know, in the spirit of citing Black women, like Dr. Jill always says, I've been writing, right? <laughs> so, like, again, Black women been doing this work, right? And so, again, I think out of a kind of decolonizing perspective, not only always attributing this work to the academy is incredibly important, right? So. We talk about the work of, you know, of Black women really advancing our community's health, advancing health and racial equity, um, educational equity. We really have to, you know, recognize 
all black women, right? Lay women, community health workers, right? People on the front line, your auntie, your mama, right? Like, you know, that ne didn't necessarily have like a terminal degree, but they literally have stood in the gap. And it actually goes to the question that I see in the chat, you know, about here I am posing these questions about, you know, what about the experiences of black girls and women when it comes to AI? And one of our Spelman sisters, Ruha Benjamin, does write, you know, extensively about, um, you know, kind of just thinking about data equity. Um, and I think it's just really important that this is what this is what I'm saying about other mothering and how we, instead of, you know, kind of waiting for someone to come in, swoop in and, you know, kind of consider the work that the our lived experiences considers our needs or our interests, our values, we do it for ourselves, right? So, you know, like we've been doing in every other facet, you know what? That's why we have organizations like Black Women's um, Black Women Code, right? <laughs> Where we can actually start to create our own algorithms and, you know, technolo um, technological tools and, again, call out um, some of the ways that AI and other kind of health, health technologies, um, you know, kind of you know, but contribute to erasure and or kind of really um, limiting or, or minimizing the fullness of who we are, contributes to profiling, contributes to, you know, all the ways in which we've seen the way technology has either exploited and or, you know, overlooked um, important populations. And so I just wanted to kind of bring that up because I am doing some um, some curriculum around medicine, equity and technology. And so I wanted to swoop in and, and um, kind of answer that question while it was on my mind. But, you know, I really do think it's is really important. And this is why I do this even in my classroom. I'm not only citing, you know, those who are, um, you know, have peer reviewed um, articles because embodied experience, lived experience is also expertise. And so I really kind of bring that in by citing the work of social activists as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. As you were talking, and I thank you for referencing that question. I didn't see it. And I want to kind of incorporate my question to the WISH Lab um, as part of trying to get at some of this. I always, talk, you know, when I usually give individual talks, I'll start off and say my family goes back to 1721 on my mom's side in North Carolina and 1791 on my dad's side, also in North Carolina. And so since that time, my family's been in Virginia and North Carolina. I bring that up because I like to say my family has been here since before this place was a country and the, the, what we call the United States. And guess what? If anything happens, we will still be here. But what my family did in building institutions, they operated without outside of systems. And so when we think about how do we do this work in the conference I was just at, which really speaking to self-determination, we really have to see the writing on the wall. This is not new. We've been here post-reconstruction. So how are we preparing the future generation, right, for a world that might look different than what we had? And, you know, I got told a lot, why don't you look at white women too, Jamita, as part of my training? And I was like, because there are a lot of people looking at white women, people aren't asking questions about Black women within group difference and why that's important. And so I'm pointing to the former students, Tony took my course, as well as Danielle and Carlisha. She didn't, she didn't really introduce herself in what she does, but she does a lot. And, um, but she took my course at Towson. What I want to say to you all, because you're not students, I know Danielle is still a student, but talk about your training and how this chapter, what it can do for our future generation and thinking about solutions and, and how we can address this work. Yes, thank you, Dr. J, for that. Um, yeah, I think that's what's so special about the WISH Lab is like having this collective space to talk about the work in the way that feels good for us and to bring in like Black feminist and Black womanist perspectives. And in our chapter, so it's titled Our Wish for Black Girls and Women's Health, and we talk about our wish for change. We talk about the gift of sisterhood, the gift of storytelling, and that is, in my experience in academia, especially in predominantly white institutions, uh, like where our course was, um, they don't always give space for that, and especially they don't give space for that in the context of Black women and girls and Black cultures and the Black diaspora. Like Dr. J, you mentioned, like when they want us to compare ourselves to other groups, it's like our group itself is so di like um, diverse, like the diaspora, even us in the WISH lab are very diverse. And we talk about that in the chapter where we come from and our backgrounds. But um, but 
that's what I appreciate about having this like sister circle of sorts as a researcher, as a writer, as a scholar, that academia and the institutions often are isolating, especially as Black women. Um, I hear stories from others, my own experiences. And so to have this space to talk about this in a radical way just gave me hope because in my public health courses, like my undergrad was in pr public health, my master's was in public health. And a lot of times, again, it's the deficit approach. It wants us to go by the status quo, do these evidence-based practices. And I'm like, that doesn't feel good for me. And so this was a hopeful space to be able to just freely brainstorm and write and collectively um, create this change as a group. And then briefly from Carlisha and Danielle. I would say that the new horizon we're looking at is embodying how this book was created. This idea for the strength approach, I think, is really revolutionary. Like we had mentioned at the beginning, there is so much literature that just talks about the plights and the pains of Black women. That literature is important, it's valuable, it has a space. And I think it's really beautiful that we're charging this new territory of what does it mean to center Black girl magic in how we write? One of the quotes that I give in the chapter is that it's not enough to resist. One must radiate. There must be this physical embodiment by Black women and girls of joy and light and laughter and love and flourishing. And I think that is the new horizon that is in front of us that we can take part of and craft and bring to further light and amplify this idea of let's center our strengths while really being particularly focused on our joy, our light, our love, what it means to be in sisterhood, like Tony mentioned, what it means to be a member of such a unique community. Thank you, Danielle. I don't know, Carlisha was having sound issues. Um, so I'll, if you can pop on, please do. I want to go to Tambra and then I see their questions in the chat. And before I go to Tambra, I just want to say one, the Wish Lab was started because I had so many students who were former students, current students, and outside students who wanted to meet with me. And I am very big, they all know here on self-care and how I take care of myself. And so I created the lab. You are welcome to email me and we can talk about how you can join the Wish Lab. Um, and I also want to mention someone else shouted out um, our other Spellman sister, Ruha Benjamin, and the work that she does. And she does some amazing work. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think we do need to have a larger conversation about the role of AI. But I want to plan it briefly to, to Tambra to have her have a question, and then we can delve deeper into the Q&As that are in the chat, because that leaves us some time um, to really delve deeper as a group in answering those questions. Um, so Tambra, as we're looking, I love the work that we do with the Council on Black Health. And I remember when um, being at that meeting, when you came up with what was the precursor to what we now have as the Black Health Bill of Rights. And um, I want, and particularly because, you know, you and I go way back to when we were in federal government. I want you to think about how do we translate, and briefly, how do we translate frameworks into the real work that needs to be done at, because we have some folks here from NIH, how do we make this transition? What advice can we give? Thank you for that. Um, I first want to thank you, Danielle. You were giving me Amanda Gorman vibes. So I have a quick poem that I wanted to speak to that, but let me first answer Jamita's question that she um, just shared. Um, since my area is definitely media technology and democracy at AU, where my work has a Black feminist lens to it. So Ruha Brenjamin and so many others, um, Sophia Noble, Moya Bailey, I love their names because these are new scholars that I incorporate into my work. Um, but one way to think about slowly as we operationalize a Black Health Bill of Rights, it can be a framework for government and those working as policy advocates is to think about one, uh, how we look at data and monitor that data when it comes to having this intersectional lens to black women and understanding that our narratives is not monolithic, that we have intersectional identities just within black women itself. And we saw that um, as an example in Maryland, when they took that to maternal health issues and saw how African women 
uh, specifically foreign born had special needs that had uh, program intervention that needed to be designed if they only saw black women from those who are just in America only, that would have been a missed opportunity of recognizing what are the cultural immigration dynamics that might be affecting their ability to transition um, to what it means to now grow a baby in the US. The other part is understanding resource allocation speaks to those issues and why here in DC we have an office on African affairs, on Caribbean affairs, because we understand the unique differences within the diaspora that must be addressed. Also, when we think about developing policy, how do we ensure that these intersectional identities are uplifted? Uh, one of the pieces that having worked and advocated with African Affairs Office and the census is understanding that while we work together in solidarity as a Black community, we have to acknowledge that our brothers and sisters who come from different identities may have special needs. And so including African as a cat, African foreign born African as a category in the census was an opportunity to understand how do we reconcile the acknowledgement that there is data that shows coming from uh, far away to America, your health begins to decline over generations. And so what is speaking to what's happening in our vir environment? So with that, I want to just wrap up my talk with um, a poem that speaks to the Black Health Bill of Rights. In the realm of health where rights unite, stand tall, the Black Health Bill of Rights. Shining bright, centering Black women, their strength and their plight. It champions their wellness, a beacon of light. With an intersectional lens, it sees through the haze, acknowledging layers, each unique phase. From race to gender in every maze, it honors their journey in myriad ways. No monolith here, but a chorus of voices. Diverse experiences, each one rejoices. Resilient and strong against all the noises. Their health matters in all of its choices. A strength-based approach it proudly displays, lifting Black women in myriad arrays. Empowered they stand in health sunlight rays, their rights upheld through all of their days. So let it be known in prose and in song, the Black health fellow rights where justice belongs. For Black women's health were forever prolonged, their rights, their voices forever strong. Thank you, Tambra. Oh my gosh, thank you. And I'm looking to Doc Dill because she's a poet, a poet extraordinaire and writes and uses that as a powerful medium um, for intervention. I do wanna read, I know Carly, she was having sound issues, but she wrote, um, this was an endeavor that was the first of its kind at Towson of PWI and for it to be something for black women and girls by black women and girls was special. For me, it was. It also highlighted an intersectional lens. and. Um, I think it's, you know, some of what Tamper said, I want to go to the questions now and hopefully all of us can look at the Q&A. I want to address a few of them and then have the rest of this panel, wonderful panel, kind of jump in. But I want to say, because Tamper, she offered up, let, let's talk about Spalding College, right? Let's be real. If you understand that the names that were mentioned, Moya Bailey, Ruha Benjamin, Ruha was the valedictorian of my class. Um, Lacante and Miranda and I know each other from Spelman, and so many other of our Spelman sisters are doing this type of work um, in some interesting ways. So let's talk about what happens when your first year in college, you, read, you have a class devoted to Black girls and women called African Diaspora of the World. So that my framework in college as a first year student is rooted in Black women, and my whole career stems from that. What happens when we change our curriculum and you center Black women? What happens when you change policy and you center Black women? I've written about that in a paper I did with Bria Johnson on women's health issues. Um, so when I'm looking at some of these questions about how we can uplift, what happens when you center Black women? We know from Black feminisms that you help everyone. Someone else mentioned Dr. Bonnie. I worked with Dr. Bonnie at Towson, um, and Carly she may remember Dr. Bonnie, and she's a be she was a beautiful spirit. And so what happened there was unfortunate. But I can tell you that those issues are not just where she was at Lincoln. It, they're everywhere. We battle that because what you heard today and what this sounds great, right? This sounds great, but you have no idea how hard it was to get the special issue. You have no idea how hard it was to get this class at GW. Okay. So these are the stories we don't talk about the fight to get a place, the fight that I had on the title of this book. Okay. With the publishers, the fact that this book is too expensive. Right, so I wanna shut up for a minute because I could talk forever. Honestly, each chapter could have its own conversation. Um, I want us to first address, um, I see there's seven questions. I tried to address a lot of the larger ones, but um, I wanna open it up. I think um, 
I like the idea. I kind of addressed a lot of them, but Kyle Moore has a question. Sorry to call you out, Kyle, but it says, what should be the balance between uplifting and supporting the work and research on Black women and girls being done by Black women and girls and pushing other white male institutions and scholars to take up that work seriously? Truth be told, there are a lot of white men who built their careers off of low-income Black women. And they did not talk to one Black woman as part of their ontology and epistemology. So we need to shift. This should be a book taught in all methods classes. Why aren't we thinking about centering Black women's voices and knowledges? Because they're frameworks. There's so many other disciplines. But I want others to chime in. Um, I can't do this in an organized way. So whoever wants to kind of respond to that, to that question, please do. Who would like to chime in? From the panel, not from the, the participants. Yeah, I can share it. So uh, then I'll, oh, Dr. Dill, if you want to go. go okay. Uh, well, I was going to say, yeah, to your point, Dr. J, is that like, yeah, a lot of academia and research has been really extractive and exploitative of our community. So there is a fine line of like, yes, we want this to be uplifted, but also it has to be at the root led and for us, right? And so to like uplift researchers and researchers in an expansive term, not just people who go to an institution or have certain degrees, but people on the ground in the community who are experts of their own lives. I think that's where I see this research and our scholarly work going is, um, so again, to your point, Dr. J, with the book not being as accessible as we would want it, because when I talk about this work, people get excited and then I'm like, oh yeah, let me <laughs> try to help you with this book. So yeah, I think just really centering our communities and uplifting our own communities' voices and then other people can use our work to share but yeah I think there's kind of a fine line between the power dynamics there thank you Dr. Dill if you could jump in and then Dr. Ward if you could jump in on the NIH question sure I would just add that um many of us are working to disrupt the systems that we're in um, we are working to shift the academic journals, the um, the academic books, the coursework curriculum, even um, showing the alignment of our important work with like CIF competencies. Um, for example, I have in the CIF competency, one of the CIF competency textbooks, I have a chapter about my pedagogy and practice of centering wellness, which is all about learning from Black feminist literature um, to learn about health broadly. Um, but I would also say, in to Dr. Um, Barlow's point of self-care, we also, I think many of us are also calling each other in around not killing ourselves for institutions that were not meant for us. Um, Dr. Alexis Pauline Gum says, um, the university does not love us, but the universe does. Um, so remembering that, we often definitely lean on our um activism, our, our communities outside of academia or outside of government. Uh, we've learned that from our instructors in the AUC that we're definitely professors and always activists. We're leaning on, you know, like, like Dr. Ward said, like our big mamas, like our aunties. So thinking about like those, the living rooms. Um, Tony, Tony K. Bambara was a professor at CUNY at Spelman, but also taught and held court in her living room, right? And people were coming from across the country to learn in her living room. So thinking about the various spaces, the community centers, the basketball courts, wherever people are gathered, there are places to learn, to disrupt, to heal, to practice. Dr. Ward, I saw you wanted to answer the AI question. Please jump in. Oh yeah, no, I answered the AI question earlier about the importance of us, you know, like not waiting for someone else to, you know, like, oh, look, they're not, they're not answering my questions about the fact that black women and girls stay overlooked in the AI space and recognizing like, okay, so this is where we come in. Like we've been doing, you know, that work in education, in healthcare now, yes, in technology, right? <laughs> so it's not like we have to wait for um, kind of someone to, to basically invite us in. But I will say that, one of the reasons why, and I appreciate the question, is that we need to ensure that we're at the table and or creating our own, you know, kind of rooms and platforms um, and or being integrated into these decisions um, and policy strategies is because, as we know, bias most certainly gets coded, right? And so this is exactly why, you know, it is absolutely necessary for, you know, these conversations to be had. And so, you know, just thinking about 
the way that you can use your own um, spheres of influence to have these conversations is a, is a good kind of starting point. And, you know, I like I see there's a lot of questions in the chat or some comments in the chat about how appreciative you are of having a space like this to just recognize and, and honor, you know, black people. <laughs> Right. Just loving it. Like, you know, here we are, it was like, you know, Women's History Month, you know, off the heels of Black History Month. And, you know, it's incredibly necessary um, to, you know, continue to like, have these carved out spaces for ourselves. And I'll also just um, end with before I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Barlow, because I see there are two questions about the Wish Lab and how to get involved. But I'll just say that. You know, when we talk about the importance of centering and, um, you know, the lived experiences and values and interests and, and knowledges of Black girls and women, we're not suggesting that only, you know, Black women can do this. We recognize that there may very well be scholars who don't have that identity that can do this work, but for them to do it, they need to be steeped in um, the epistemologies of Black women, right? <laughs> so that it's not performative and tokenized and exploitative like we've been talking about, right? So, and then not to mention there's such within group um, kind of diversity um, that needs to kind of come to the fore with it. whoever does this work including Black women. Thank you for that, Dr. Ward. For example, in the WISH Lab, we have South Asian women, we have white women. Two of the co-authors in the WISH Lab were white women, identify as white women. Um, and so what I would offer, I know we're, we're right at the end time. If, that, if I'm correct, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Williams shortly. But I just want to thank all of you all publicly for the time and all the many emails I sent you and all the edits. Um, and for also standing in the gap and that's what I think is the work. Someone had the question about how do we remain loyal to each other? I honestly couldn't have written a book, but I knew that I could call upon my village to get a book that needed to be heard at such a time as this, when books are being banned, when we literally have policies that are saying to call yourself a black owned business, um, or focusing on black women is a bad thing. It's becoming unconstitutional. So this, I'm inspired by my ancestors who built a school in the 1800s post -reconstru during reconstruction in a time when black people were still being lynched, when black people were still being punished for reading and writing. I, wa I wrote about that in the intro. This is important work. And regardless of what's happening, we're gonna still be here and do the work. And this time calls for us to do this type of work. So I wanna thank all of you for being here. If you wanna reach out to me, um, I can, can you put my email in the chat, Dr. Williams? I'm happy for them to email me, J-N Barlow, and as in Nicole, B-A-R-L-O-W at gwu.edu. I will find, I will respond. Give me, a, give me about a week because I'm out of town and I believe in turning it off on a Friday afternoon. Um, but I will respond to you next week. I hope that you're all well and taking care of yourselves. And I'm immensely thankful that you could have been anywhere, but you decided to be here. Even the chapter authors, thank you. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm in gratitude. And it would be a missed service to not acknowledge um, Shirley Chisholm's documentary drops today on Netflix. So make your little black girl spaces, watch it, talk about it, be inspired election year. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Tambra. And let's remember black women create institutions and Shirley Chisholm, why we have the Congressional Black Caucus is because of Shirley Chisholm. So let, mm -hmm. let's be real about the work that they've done regarding policy, et cetera, affect girls and women and black folks. So thank you all so much. Again, I'm just and not even a shameless plug. The book, the book, the book is available. I put the um, flyer in the chat box, but I will also be emailing it out to everyone. So make sure that you get your copy of this book and read it, use it and share it. So thank you all so much. If you have an idea for something, please reach out to me and let me know because I would love to feature more work focused on Black girls and women's health. So with that being said, thank you so much. And thank you again to our panelists. Thank you, Jamita. I just appreciate you assembling this wonderful panel of women who are doing amazing work. So thank you all so, so very much. And happy Women's History Month.